Very good. Um, A lot of the information I'm going to be giving you today will overlap with each other. I have several presentations, so don't be surprised if we repeat things also that Todd Gilligan said and Jim Hayden said, and this is done on purpose to make sure you hear this information several times. As you already know from the plans for the survey, we're using traps that have glue. The traps we're going to use um, probably have polyisobutylene, PIB, and the chemicals we use work very well for removing this glue. And don't expect only the targets to show up on this trap or similar specimens. You can end up with uh, leaves, other insects, other moths. And the traps look a little bit like a shelter, so that's why you might be able, you may end up finding other insects. And before we go too far, there are proper ways to transport and move these traps. So never put plastic on top of them or ever flatten the two faces. Make sure you roll them gently against the folding line and you can hold that fold with a, a rubber band, a paper clip or a piece of tape or just a plastic bag. But this glue tends to travel tends to stick to everything. So always keep these straps rolled and inside plastic bags. Before you start on any process, examine carefully the sticky trap. You can just, just use a magnifying lens but make sure you have good lighting or under a microscope, but be careful not to spread the glue on your microscope surfaces, top or bottom, or the lenses. Another point I wanted to make is that the moths may not fall in a position that is convenient for us. They could be upside down or twisted or on top of each other. But we already learned enough yesterday to know that what we're looking for are small moths. So about one centimeter in length, and they have narrow wings, and we expect them to be brown, spotty, brown, mottled with specks. When you handle these cards, uh, remember not to put your finger in the middle, the glue will keep spreading. So use gloves and handle the sticky cards only from the edges. Another point to always remember, don't try to manipulate a specimen in the glue to see a character, or don't try to remove it. They'll just completely break apart. We're getting close now to how do we get the glue off the specimens. And I wanted to let you know, we're using the word moths, but you can use this technique to remove other insects from sticky cards if you have other surveys. Um, use a pair of scissors that is marked glue or another way, but don't use these scissors for other things because they will always have glue, even if you try to clean them. So cut around the moths without damaging them. Make sure you don't cut their legs off or the antenna or the wings. So cut around them carefully. Try to work over paper towels so that the glue doesn't stick on the table and then the table will share the glue with everything else it touches. So use paper towels or recycled paper, anything you have underneath. Although we use a different thing today, the best way to deglue insects is with um, a little bit of heat. If you have an electric heater or it could be in, in your kitchen and if, uh, with gas, anything you can to have some warm water. We prefer, or I prefer around 65, 70, 75, but you can make it hotter and you can make it cooler but let's say that you use 40 degrees, it will just take you a little longer to do this process. I always use a thermometer every day to make sure the water is around this temperature. I prefer to use a metal pan or pot because of experiences I've already had using glass. Although some labs 
and then use glass. I always use three baths, three containers. For today, you can use only two, but let me give you the proper training. I use three containers, doesn't have to be glass, any metal, could be metal, it could be plastic, if you are going to use it in a cold method. But let's use the proper way, three glass containers, add some histo clear, and place your um, containers, your glass containers in the water bath. Notice on my left, I have scissors and simple forceps mark glue. That way I only use them for this process. You have been sent information safety sheet for Histoclear too. It is very safe, but if you keep using it, you will irritate your skin because it removes oils. So don't let it touch your skin too much. So I would recommend always using gloves especially if you can, disposable gloves. We've tried also Goo Gone, which is also um, containing um, oil, citrus oils that are synthetic, but Goo Gone has many other chemicals. So uh, it can damage specimens or it's not as easy to do. So just use it as a backup, but we do recommend using Histoclear. Your first step, after you cut around each moth, is placing them on your first container with warm histoclear. It is marked either one or dirty, which is where we get most of the glue. Always remember to write labels to go with your specimens. It's really easy. To, to lose information from um, this process. And sometimes from one container to the other, the label appears to disappear. It gets stuck to something else. So keep an eye on that label. You don't have to do anything in that step, usually, to separate the specimen from the cardboard. They let you know when they're ready. They float up and the cardboard stays on the bottom. However, if the sample is too moldy and there's hyphae, there's fungi, the moth may stay attached longer to the cardboard. So you can nudge it very carefully with a brush, but don't pull it off forcefully. So this step um, is, is usually very easy. You let it sit for a while and the moths pop up. Although I didn't write it here, you should remove those cardboards from this container as early as possible so that this dish remains as clean as possible for as long as possible. Amanda, are there any questions? No, I don't think we have any questions so far. We, we have a few more people that, are, that have just uh, joined the meeting, so. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the second little presentation will cover the same thing, so they'll definitely be able to catch up. Okay. So um, let's uh, just give everyone a moment. Uh, this is going to be really important because this is really what we're doing next. Uh, maybe I could get like um, a reaction from everyone on their screen, but could you let me know if you have your screen card? See if you look at the reaction bar. Like thumbs up or thumbs down if you have your sticky card for the activity. Some, yeah. I'm getting a response from some, but it's it's going to be really important to have your um, your card. So we want to go ahead and get out, and also the Histoclear that we um, we sent you, but you'll have to use it sparingly because um, there's not much there, but you will have to use it sparingly. Okay, let's continue. After after the specimens detach themselves from the cardboard, you transfer the specimens very carefully to your second dish. This is where most of the glue is removed from the actual specimen, not just detach them from the cardboard. If you have your third uh, container, this is the last step that
that makes them very clean. After the third soaking, which is just a few minutes, two, three minutes, then again, you remove them very carefully and lay them on whether paper towels or filter paper and let them air dry. Notice that I have the label always following the specimen. There are some options. For example, when we have very clean fluids like today, all you need is two steps. And as you can see on number, step number three here, today we can do it cold. It may take a little longer, but it can be done. And if you are even more um, restricted um, in the amount of histoclear that you have, you can pour a few dot, a few drops of histoclear onto the specimen on the cardboard, on the sticky card, and wait for them to detach a few minutes later, maybe eight to 10 minutes later, and then lift them onto the histoclear bath. I'm going to switch to the second presentation showing you how to do our practice. This is just a few slides. It's a summary of the presentation I just gave you. And for those of you who missed it, this presents the same thing in a very succinct way. Number one, you got around the specimens without damaging them. Work over paper towels and designated tools so that the glue does not start spreading around in your lab and use gloves. Select two or three containers in which you have histoclear. Um, for today, we can keep them at room temperature. And we'll be using again this chemical called histoclear 2, synthetic citrus oil, that is very good at dissecting, uh, uh, sorry, at removing this glue. It's, it's not a caustic chemical, but it might irritate your skin, so protect your skin. Drop the specimens that are stuck in the cardboard in your first container. And after a few minutes, the specimens detach themselves and they float up. This is the most important step. You don't rush it or you can damage the specimen. Let them float up. Then carefully, you transfer them to a second container with histoclear, which is very clean histoclear. Additional glue is removed. And if we have a third one, this step can be skipped. You have the last rinse and then you let them air dry. The specimens, you just put them on a paper towel or filter paper and let them dry. And at the very end, these specimens are very clean, but they're very crispy. They can break easily. So man, uh, handle them carefully. And that's the last step. Amanda, do you want me to leave, to leave the first or the second presentation up or none of them during the practice, which we begin now? Uh, Julieta, that's of course uh, a great point. Um, unfortunately, once we go to the practice, uh, every, everybody will be in their own breakout rooms and so they won't see the presentation anyway. Um, but what we can do is each of the group leaders has access to the presentation. And so I would encourage the group leaders to, um, to actually um, plan to um, pull up that presentation as they need to. Um, I guess before we go into the break, does everyone understand that, um, that now when we go into the breakout, you'll need to be prepared to to speak and to also um, actually share your screen and, and begin the process of specifically removing the moth from a sticky traps. That's what we're going to do now, now in the breakout session. So are there any questions for Juliet? Everyone also has the PDF version of these presentations, so you can have them on your screen on your own. Uh, and there is uh, opportunity for additional questions in the chat if anybody happens to have them. I guess with that, uh, I'm about to open up all the rooms. Everybody's ready. 
Anybody have any questions? All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, see how the rooms are going. And so I will be visiting the rooms and making sure everyone is able to share their, their screen. You should have an invitation to your room and you should be able to join. Okay, thanks everybody for, for muting now that we're back in the main session. Uh, I'd like you to go down to your reaction bar and tell me, did you learn something from that? Was that a good experience? And uh, some of you, was that some of you for the first time that you've actually removed um, a moth from a sticky card with Histoclear? Yes, this is the first time. First time, first time. Very good. Maybe we could hear from each group just to tell us a little bit about the experience. Um, and yeah, we're, we're kind of learning as we go, particularly with some of this, um, you know, so I know for some of this, this may not have been new. For some of you, it may have been new. Andy, can you tell me, you know, any highlights in your group with, with what's happened so far? And my group, they did pretty well. I was like surprised how they, they were able to handle it. Seems like they, they were already experienced, but not they caught it pretty well they were already done like uh, even five minutes before mm -hmm. uh, that that's pretty good and they they say they're gonna try to to redo the experiment again and again so they can be master on it yeah it's one of those things that you know the more you do it the faster you get probably julieta can do this in like a second or less i'm not sure but you know she can tell you all about that in her presentations. But yes, the more you're you're handling these sticky cards, obviously the faster it is. What about uh, group two, um, uh, Hannah and uh, Jim? How did that go? Very well, I think. Um, it was we had varying. It took different people took different amount of time, um, but I think everybody got the specimens off of the separated from the card. Um, I want to reassure everybody that if you go through the second wash, it will be, and then dry the specimen entirely, it will look like glue never touched it. It looks like it was freshly caught. Um, it's specimens taken, you know, through HistoClear can, and, and then dried are amazingly, you know, nice. Mm, yeah, I think uh, we, we noticed that room temperature HistoClear um, versus the water. Yeah, it hurt, helps to heat the specimens, mm -hmm. heat up the heating, um, makes the degluing go faster. Yeah, that, that came up in a few groups, so I thought that was really nice. And it was just really fun for me to kind of see all the labs. I mean, you guys did such a wonderful job kind of interacting in your groups, so so kudos. Um, what about the, um, the, the third group? Um, Julieta and Lyle. I thought it went great. Uh, yeah, uh, kind of like what Jim said, uh, sometimes it took a little longer, especially if uh, they had to cut around specimens that had uh, the glue trap cardboard on one side and the plastic bag on the other. It took a little longer to remove specimens there, but with patience, it, it eventually comes off. So I think people, it was successful. Mm -hmm. And it is, like we've said, just one of those things that when you start doing this repetitively, like anything else you're doing out in the field, it gets a lot faster. What yeah, about just, just watching Julieta's uh, talk again or going through a presentation will mm -hmm. really get it in your mind of all the steps. It, it's a really easy thing. Sarah, how did everything go for you guys? And I think, Rishi, you might have been in, in Sarah's group. The success, the heating method worked really good. I got both moths off, off of the sticky trap. Uh, Suriname also commented that they did this for the first time. Uh, Kel, Kel is her from Suriname, that they did this for the first time and it worked well. Um, and um, we'll send pictures as well. Um, uh, would anybody else like to, I think Claire, you were in, uh, and, and Rishi, you were um, in Sarah's group. Would either one of you like to comment on how that went for your group? Sure, hi. Um, we seem to uh, have a little bit of problem getting it to come off quickly in the um, Histoclear. And then I think most of us resorted to using our um, heat to kind of help it on mm -hmm. its way. But I think everybody was seemed to 
be moving along and able to cut it up and um, able to soak it and eventually get to where most of us have it dislodged. Mine took a minute it's off now. Okay, so it's, it's all happening fairly seamlessly. Um, other comments from anyone else that um, about this? Yes, Rishi. Yes, um, so it's dislodged, it's in, in the first solution. Moving it to the second solution, you have to use your forcep to take it out. Yes, and I use you I use clean forceps. I don't use the ones that you've been manipulating the glue with because you'll keep okay. spreading the glue. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And to clean everything, mm -hmm. just use Sister Clear at the end of your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julieta. That's that's an excellent point. And Sarah, we got the summary from your group from Rishi and Claire provided the summary from your group. And um, and then um, I've got a comment from Akil uh, that he left that uh, left the first bit of his to clear on the heater, and then after moved it to the second wash, noticed a cloudy change in the first wash. Any reason why, Julieta? Yes, that's going to be normal because the first wash is going to accumulate glue. It's the glue that is dissolving it. So that's why we call it the dirty dish, and you only use it just to separate the specimens from the cardboard. And that's why you have to remove the specimens into clean histoclear. Eventually, when you have your own quantity, you can use, uh, use second and third washes on the first dish, which is always dirty. And um, always finish your process with very clean histoclear. The first one will always get cloudy. Um, in the email that I sent everyone, Julieta had provided me instruction that we could reuse Histoclear. So it sounds to me like with that limited supply that you have right now, it might be better to kind of keep the dirty Histoclear separate from the clean than hopefully get more Histoclear. We, we could only send you 50 milliliters of Histoclear in your specimen packages uh, simply because of shipping requirements. So you'll have to use it sparingly. Julieta, would you like to comment further on that? What Amanda said was exactly right. Don't mix them up. If you have two vials that you received in the mail, label one dirty or step one, and that should only be used to separate them from the cardboard. Try to keep your second vial as clean as possible. That will be your second wash. Mm -hmm. Just because you are trying to use it sparingly as well. And so, yeah. um, we have a question from Lyle Buss in the chat. Can specimens removed from glue traps with the method be relaxed and pinned? The specimens come out a very crispy, very dehydrated, as Jim can, can explain. So, so you cannot move any part. So you are correct, Lyle. They have to be relaxed, probably overnight. And then on the following day, they can be Pinned like any other moth. I agree. Yeah, I often um, uh, pin specimens, larger specimens that I have put through history after relaxing overnight. Uh, however, uh, for very small moths, uh, such as Gelichaeids, I would advise uh, beginners to um, put them in a gel capsule because they're so small. If you're not good at pinning things, um, if you're not experienced with pinning very, very small moths, then just put them in a gel capsule um, so that they don't shatter if you don't, you know, make a, mista uh, make a mistake. Um, but then again, it's also uh, make sure that the specimens are totally dry before putting them into the gel capsule. That's an excellent point. Uh, are there additional questions before we move on? Seeing additional questions, I think this was an excellent um, discussion and activity. And now we're going to move on to Julieta Brambilla's presentation about uh, um, helicoverpa uh, dissection. And that's, that's uh, where we're going to get into those abdomens that we've been soaking in KOH. The three presentations that I'm giving you today are standalones. They can be seen in any order. So I am giving this presentation now instead of at the end so that we're ready to do some dissections. But after this one, there will be a third presentation that I want you to see on how to screen specimens when they are in the glue 
and when, are, when they are just clean from the glue. So let's skip to this one. It's hard to actually dissect moths. And this applies to large, medium, or small specimens. This technique applies to all moths. Make sure if you have questions, put them in the chat box and Amanda can interrupt me. And um, Jim Hayden is there too, and he can correct me. As a reminder, again, this is not a, um, a, a survey in which we're getting clean specimens from the field. We're getting them from um, Delta cards, Delta traps with glue cards. And you can see on the picture on the right that you may end up with other, other moths. In this case, there are no two, is they're large. So you end up with other things, not just Galakiids. You already have experienced this part. You cut around the specimens. You soak them in the first bath to remove them from the cardboard. Wash them two or three times in clean, is to clear, and then you air dry them. But let them air dry completely. They will look very clean and in great shape. Put your clean specimens on a dish, and this is a time when you can start looking in the microscope and see how close your specimen is to the target. So in this picture, I'm showing you um, several specimens that are around the right range of color and size, and they all have narrow wings. You ignore the large moths. You don't have to waste time cleaning or, or doing anything to the large moths or anything smaller, let's say, than, than half a centimeter. Stay within this range. But at this stage, you can tell here that they all look alike. So if you're really trying to do an early detection for tuta, you cannot escape having to go forward into this section. At this moment, with this picture, you can see they all look alike. There are five steps that cannot be skipped in the preparation of the specimens. This is the part that takes a little longer than the other steps. This is the actual treatment of the specimens so that you can dissect them. I'll go through all of them in various screens. It's just obtaining the abdomens. You always keep labels with them. You soak them in alcohol before actually treating them with KOH. And at the end, you cool and rinse are, are ready to dissect. Whether your specimens are large or small, you need the abdomen, not the whole specimen, but I mean the whole abdomen. Don't break them in the middle or only take the tip. And when your specimens are especially in good condition, dry and crispy as I like them, the abdomen itself breaks from the thorax easily. You don't, you don't grab and pull, you don't grab and twist. You just push up the abdomen while holding the thorax. This applies also to, to pinned specimens. I'll always emphasize, don't forget your labeling. You can start losing data very easily if you don't keep track of your specimens. And um, on the line number two, you can see this is what um, Jim Hayden recommended. For very small, small specimens, you can keep them in gel capsules. Don't try to pin them. And in an envelope, they're just too small for an envelope. So you can keep them in a vial, dry, or use gel capsules. The first step before you can ice KOH is soaking them in alcohol. It's just a couple of minutes if you have a large specimen, but for our little specimens that we, you will do later in the day, it's just a few seconds. But let's think that we're using helicoverpazia for this first practice. So it's one to two minutes. This step with KOH is the most important one. Without this step, you cannot see any structure inside the abdomen and you cannot obtain the genitalia. Remember KOH, whether it's cold or hot, 
it is corrosive. It is very dangerous for your eyes, especially. So wear gloves at all time. If you get a KOH on your skin, simply wash it with water. It's water soluble. And the reason we're using KOH, although we can use sodium hydroxide as well, it dissolves um, tissues that are not chitinous. So it removes other tissues, let's say proteins, and it removes fats, fats and oils and grease. Although you can do the cold treatment overnight or longer, I always work with hot KOH, but for today we can work with a cold treatment. I always use the same temperature only because it's neither too hot nor too cold. There's not a magic reason for this value. It's just safer than 100 degrees, uh, but you can, you can always use 100 degrees, it'll just, work, it'll just be faster. When you put your vials in the heater, this is just water heated, do use, do use a lid, but don't screw them up tightly um, because when you open them, it could splash you with KOH. So keep the lid loose so that hot air is always able to, to come out. If you're using the hot method, I recommend 45 minutes. If you have it hotter, it may be 20, 25 minutes. If it's warmer, meaning cooler around 40 degrees, it could be a couple hours. The timing is not that um, specific and each lab, each one of you will adapt to what you want to do in your lab. If you want to use my method, here it is, 70 degrees for 45 minutes. I'm just reminding you here in the, in the bottom line, protect your eyes from the hot KOH. This is a cold method. It's really used by a lot of people for very small specimens. It works just fine cold overnight. For large specimens, I use 24 hours or a little longer. Let's assume you're using my method. So after heating them for 45 minutes, take the vials out from the bath water and let them cool slowly and naturally to room temperature. I usually give them 15 minutes. The reason I let them cool down is that when I have put them directly in alcohol or water, I've seen bubbles form, not only inside the abdomen, but inside the genitalic structures, making this section more difficult. These specimens are ready to be dissected. However, like I always do, I prefer to rinse them. You can use alcohol or water, but it's an optional step. You've already prepared the specimens. You have the abdomens, you kept up with the labels, you have soaked them, and you have treated them with KOH, cooled them, rinsed them, and you are ready to dissect. This dissection um, applies to any moth, but we're going to be thinking today only about large moths and small moths. So what we're going to do, we're going to clean the abdomens. We are going to remove the genitalia from the abdomens. We're going to clean the valve. We're going to open them up and, and we'll end up with some illustrations of what the genitalia look like once they're dissected for three species. At the bottom is Helicoverpazia, our first practice species. Second from the bottom is our target, Tutapsoluta, which we don't have at present on purpose. And then we're going to get really familiar with the tomato pinworm, that is Kefiria lycopersicella, and the reason we sent you these species is, is because most likely you will find this in your samples and it will scare everybody up. It will look like a false positive. So that is the main species I want you to learn today, actually, the tomato pinworm. On my presentation, I'm not going to show you how to do permanent glass mountings. 
you will have the information and you have Jim Hayden um, for learning that technique. I can do it too, but in my work, because I deal with hundreds and thousands of specimens, I don't slide mount. Let's begin with transferring your treated specimens to a dish with clean alcohol. You can use water if you prefer, or soapy water like Jim Hayden has taught me to do. When you transfer a specimen, you're going to notice it is full of scales. You could not do what you, you could not see a specimen like this that you see on the screen in which everything is clean. So your first step is cleaning the specimen. What's covering the abdomen are scales. And inside the abdomen, there'll be intestines, there will be fats, there will be other structures, malpigian tubules. So all of that needs to be removed or at least partially removed so that you can proceed with the technique. And the dish with water or alcohol will become dirty very quickly. So you can um, keep removing it and adding fresh liquid. So for now, only deal with one specimen at a time in a very clear field of view. You can see the specimen on the right is the same as on the left, except I have removed the genitalia. You do not have to reach that level of cleanliness, but it was just to show you what a difference it makes to clean a specimen. To remove the genitalia, whether the specimen is large or little, you do it very carefully, but don't try first to pull on it. So you hold the abdomen from its base and gently press on the abdomen and the fluids inside will push the genitalia out of the apex of the abdomen. If it only comes halfway, then you grab them gently with forceps and pull them the rest of the way. Sometimes the genitalia is already partially out, making it very easy to finish pulling them out. Other options are opening the abdomen, that way you have access to the genitalia directly. And another um, option is to not detach them from the abdomen, to keep all parts together, and that is just fine as well. When the valve come out out of the abdomen, in some species like Helicoverpa, you cannot really see anything. There's even more CD of the genitalia. So at least remove some of them. You can use a brush or um, tweezers, not by grabbing and pulling the CD, just by brush, brushing them to the side. You can clean them completely or in like this photograph, it's just fine to remove some of the city. And this is when you start becoming a detective. Look at every detail, the bottom character, the top, the side, the valves. Don't break anything, just observe and clean. This sample here looks a little cleaner. So the cleaner it is, the better you can see. And usually the genitalia is closed, the valves are close to each other. Let me show you this. This is the normal shape of the genitalia when they come out of a specimen, they're closed. Here, I have opened them, and on this photograph, I've actually flattened them. You can just push gently with, with your forceps, or you can put a, a piece of glass from a broken cover slip and press on them. That way you can actually see the shape of every part. Sometimes we remove the phallus, which is a structure that's inside that lets you see both structures separately. It may be hard at first, so this is not essential to do, it's just recommended if you can. With not having to learn all these body parts, I'm just going to call attention to you, let's say to three body parts. This is a tomato pinworm the one that you will see probably very soon in your surveys. Notice these structures, how unique they are. That's why we use genitalia 
this section to identify species. On the outside, it may be a brown mouth, but on the inside, there's a lot of characters. Just look at three characters. A, that's onchus. Notice the shape. In this case, it's a spine. It's a long structure, pointy. Let's look at B. This is to me the most important character. This is one, the valve, but it is very modified. To me, it looks like a hand and a thumb. So just remember, and you can even use it with your hands. When I do the training in person, I act this out with my two arms, my two hands, and my two thumbs. So, Kefiria has arms, hand, and a thumb. There's a third structure that I'd like you to, to notice. E is the vinculum. It is long. In other species, it may be short. This is long and narrow. Let's compare it to our target. Notice the vinculum. It's broad. Yes, it's long, but it is broad at the base and broad in the center. Now let's look at some of my other two characters that I recommend. The onchus, this structure, I'll go back. It's narrow and long in your false positive. And if this is the species you find, look at that. It looks like a hood, like a baseball cap. This is the same structure, onchus. And the last structure I want you to see and notice is the valve. Instead of having a hand with a thumb, it looks to me like a, like a hairy finger. And that's how I call this species, the hairy finger. Today, however, you are going to be practicing with a larger specimen for your first dissection. It looks totally different, but they have the same body parts. The valve, they don't have any extensions. They're just kind of rectangular. And they have a thorn, a crown of thorns at the edge. The onchus, which is another character I like you to see. Yeah, it's long and pointy, but it's very curved. And look at the vinculum. It is not elongated. I think I would call it globular. It's roundish and short. This is your last um, slide for this presentation. Please notice everything here. You can actually start identifying your species without having to detach the genitalia from the abdomen if you clean it really well. You can already start seeing some of the body parts. That's why I don't do mountings because I can already start deciding if it's a likely positive or just completely something different, which I call negative. So you don't need to identify every moth that you trap or clean or dissect. You just, is it or it is not? And maybe a few species to learn like the tomato pinworm. You can see all the parts here already. We've got the long broad vinculum, the oncus is broad, and it looks like a baseball hat. And here's the valve with its extension, a hairy curved finger. I can go through this presentation if you want to from the beginning, but I'll stop here. It's the last slide and I'm ready for your questions. Do we have any questions for Julia? And especially if Jim Hayden wants to uh, talk about variations, corrections, suggestions, here is the time. Dr. Dr. Hayden, do you have any further comments? Uh, thanks. Um, no, this is great. Thanks. This is perfect. Uh, yeah, that's just, the only difference I'd say is I don't, um, I, I don't really have a problem with bubbles when I transfer from hot KOH to cold KOH. I just take it right out of the hot KOH and put it into uh, cold water, I mean. Um, I don't really, so don't worry about, I mean, we can let it cool down, but if you, um, you know, it's not a, big problem for me. It's really good to know, Jim. Thank you. But yeah, otherwise, no, this is exactly how I do it. We had to, you're getting some virtual claps. So, I mean, I think everyone is following along and it's very good information. Thanks. I, for some reason, I don't see the chat, so I can, I'm only relying on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, comments for great pre presentation and also some virtual claps uh, from people watching. So let's continue, Julieta. No, that's the end. That's the end. All right. So uh, if there are no um, questions, then um, 
Uh, we will be heading to our breakouts where we will now take our um, helicoverpa zea abdomens and begin the dissection. Julieta, do you have specific instructions for all of the groups before we begin with this process? Just follow the handout. Everything is written in the handout. Um, however, I do remember that you received your specimens apparently already soaking in alcohol. So just to go through this, go through the process as if they were dry. Um, break up the abdomen, touch them in alcohol a little bit, just for practice, and then proceed on the next steps. Normally I work with uh, dry specimens, mm -hmm. but it will not affect in any way your training or the results. Perhaps I could explain why we put them into alcohol. Um, that was just for, uh, that was for the sake of uh, shipping. Um, yes. Because we were afraid that the specimens might be delayed in shipping, there is um, danger that they would start to decay and rot. And if, especially if they started to become fungal, uh, with high, uh, fungus gets into the abdomen, then it becomes full of hyphae, and then it's very, very, very hard to dissect. So we thought that it would be better to keep them in alcohol to uh, prevent fungal in um, getting in, fungi getting in. Now the alcohol is a de dehydrating agent. It removes water. So it, uh, this genitalia might be a little bit stiffer, more stiff than uh, they would be if they were dry. However, in my experience, uh, dissecting things that have been pre previously placed in alcohol is not really much difference. It does not really, uh, the, all the parts, the valvae and so forth, should still be flexible enough to manipulate. An excellent po point, Dr. Hayden. Thank you so much. Um, well, this is really exciting, and um, we're, we're, we're looking forward to, to joining the breakouts and really getting started with this uh, Helicoverpa Zaya dissection. And so uh, with that, I think we're going to go in our rooms. You know, I will kind of leave it to the breakout leaders. I just want to bring it to everyone's attention that we have not formally had a break. And so when you get into your breakout room, if you think your group needs a break, feel free to take a five or 10 minute break before you start with the uh, dissection or, or, or perhaps participants will break while they're going through the dissection. After we, um, after everyone is, is comfortable with the dissection for Helicoverpa Zaya, we will uh, come back into the main room. Thank you so much. Welcome back. We're excited to, to be back in the main session. And um, then I wanna hear, I think we had some really great things happening in the groups. And so we're gonna talk about that briefly and then we're gonna head into our final presentation. Julieta has another presentation for today. Um, group two. That's our group. I think everyone did great. Mostly everyone who had specimens were able to see the genitalia, and we were able to see it through the microscopes. And uh, Dr. Hayden showed us a couple of other um, moths or genitalia and I think we we learned a lot and everyone was successful in dissection dissecting their helicoverpa. Seemed like you guys had a lot of fun when I was popping in on on your your group so thanks. For great, the, conversation. great conversation. Great conversation. Anybody else from group two want to say anything? Yeah how did you all think about that? I wanted to find out what gender it was. I don't remember just to ask that. Hold on. It's male helicopter. Mm -hmm. Yep, male. Mm -hmm. Or a male. Very well, look at that. Good. Yeah, I just love it that we were seeing a lot of this in groups, actually seeing what's happening, you know, at the scope from the group. So. Wonderful job there, Javin Way. Thanks for spreading such great groups. Um, group three, uh, that would have been the group that had Julieta and Lyle. 
Lyle was doing dissections as well. So I think it's going on, going pretty good. This is cool. We had uh, several groups giving us uh, pictures of every step. And I was able to photograph them off the screen with my own cell phone. So uh, it was nice that I could take them to the next step and to the next step. Wonderful. Does anybody else from this group, group three, want to comment on what you guys learned and did during this time? I could change the word in my presentation to be more applicable. Instead of saying open the genitalia like a book, it came out better, open it up like a clam. Oh, like a clam. Like a clam. And then I did not add this on the presentation, but sometimes the clam wants to close again and close again. So you actually force it open until you hear a click and that's a ligament breaking. And from then on, the, the genitalia will stay flat and open. It makes a lot of sense. That's, that, that does. Wonderful. Yeah, I, we were talking about cooking meat during our, our presentation, and I was I compared it to the longer you cook it, you know, it's like getting the meat to fall off the bones. But you shouldn't, shouldn't have to struggle with to, you know, to clean the hairs and fats off, but it, it, it should just come off the cuticle. So yeah. I like cooking metaphors. You steam clams until they open. Very good. That's the best. Really good reference. Sarah, how did everything go in your group? All right. Well, we did pretty good. Um, well, you had a, a little bit of mixed results, people being on different um, levels and phases of the uh, protocol. But um, we got a couple of really great images and little success stories of people getting the uh, genitalia out, um, being able to remove the valvi, um, get a good look at it with the valvi too. Um, so I think overall, we're pretty satisfied with um, how it went. Everybody seemed to kind of get the hang of it. Um, we had a couple of female specimens pop in there too. So um, when you see that little globular part come out, that's the bursa, right? That's the female part. Can somebody correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, there are okay. a couple of structures, the corpus bursi and also the uh, appendix bursi is, the appendix bursi is also unusually large in, in helicoverpa. So I think one of our uh, members got that out um, of a female specimen. So that was neat. We got to see a little bit of a difference between the male and females. So That's great. Would anybody else from the group that Sharon comment about, you know, or show any of their pictures? All right, there you go. Wow. Yeah. That's what I got. So I was just checking if this was male or female. Yeah, yeah so you got the valvi off to the side there. Right. Good. Good. All right. Thank you. Right. That's my final picture. I'm going to show you all. Yes. Look at that. Look at that. That's wonderful. Those are perfect. Yes. Well, that's, uh, that's so great. You guys, we're, we're really, um, we're really, really making some progress. Anybody else want to share before we go on with the next presentation? We're at the presentation time, and so if I could ask everybody to mute, and um, and then uh, we will proceed with um, with Julieta's presentation. Julieta, our final presentation for the day. Thank you. Um, the reason for this last presentation is to give you confidence that you can do this survey and don't worry too much of all the other things that are going to come into your trap. And you're going to say, well, tut absoluta is just a little brown moth. We cannot do anything. I'll show you, you can. And there's the three levels, the, the step where the specimens are stuck on the glue cards, the step where you have cleaned them from the glue and then a dissection. So you have three chances to narrow down if you have likely the target, or let's say what I keep expecting, which is a tomato pinworm. If it doesn't look like tuta, then your result is negative and you don't have to worry about identification of the next month of the, of the month. Let me show you how. Let's begin at the beginning. 
were using glue cards in Delta cards. On the right side, you see a trap that was run over, was run just for 12 hours. So the specimens are clean and that would be ideal. But most of these surveys run these traps for one to two weeks, each trap. So you're going to find the specimens damaged or moldy or overlapping on a weird conditions. So it's not as easy as the right trap. So we can still proceed. Notice here that the specimens can be in any position, the wings open or sideways or upside down. So these are typical, typical, typical examples, but start noticing the characters that you can see. So don't give up. If you can see my cursor, my arrow, look at already this, look at the antennae. They're long, they're thin, they're banded. I can already see that the wings are modeled brown with other colors. I can see the fringes on the wings. Look here. Um, the long labial palpi banded, the long antennae banded, the fringe. So you can see characters here already. All of these are high suspects for Tuta. One thing I have not mentioned before is that I always use a little ruler when I am um, screening. And I actually print them from the computer on, a, on paper and cut around them. And I can put it right next to the specimens, whether in the alcohol stage or on the glue stage, just to give me an idea of the size of the specimen. So let's start from the beginning of this slide. At this level, looking at sticky cards, you need good lighting and at least a magnifying lens. You can use a microscope, but then you can get the glue on the microscope. So I prefer a magnifying lens or just your eyes. Remember to wear gloves or the glue will go everywhere. It's best to you work over paper towels. Handle the sticky cards only from the edge. And at this stage, don't try to change the position of a moth on the glue card or don't try to remove them unless you have poured histoclear on them. So don't try to remove them by force. And there's your various pictures of rulers that I recommend. Start noticing also, not just the color of the specimens on the, on the card, but the size. If you see large moths, like on the right, an octuid, this is already about four centimeters. You don't need to worry anything about that big. Screen them out of your mind. So if it's already more than 1.2 centimeters, that's already too large. And there are moths that are really small, three, four, five millimeters. Again, you do not need to worry about those very little ones. And because the moths can be in any position, the, the measurements are not easy to do. Like here, these are very beautifully spread specimens. They're going to be in all kinds of positions. So it's best to use four wing length, four wing length from the body of the moth to the tip. And it's just approximate. You don't have to worry about the exact measurements. That's the size of the moths that you should be worrying about, about one centimeter long or wide in any direction. You can continue to screen your specimens right on the glue. The target we're looking for is dark brown, but it's very mottled with orange and silvery gray and black spots, which are made of scales. That's already good enough to start saying, we're getting close to the target. Um, a little note is that if the wing is covered with glue, the colors will look darker as if they had water. Notice the specimens on the right. If they have sections that are different color of black and white, it's actually a very large moth and it has red and black and the wings are not narrow and this is orangish brown, none of these look like the target. So you can start screening out lots of the specimens. 
here it is. This is the closest to your target. In real life, this is the actual target to the absolute. Notice on the previous page what I mentioned, the wings are large, they're wide. The target to the absolute has very narrow wings. They have very narrow wings. And although I don't mention it very much, look at the fringe. All of these scales are really long. The most important character, and you can actually see this in some specimens in glue, is look at the hind wing. Look at the margin on the hand wing, on the, on, the, on the apical margin. This is the apical margin, the most distant one. Look at this part, it's concave. This part is pointy. It's the same here, pointy and then concave. So you can actually already see this character in specimens in the glue or when you are cleaning them. Even in the glue, you can see some head characters. Remember the ones we learned yesterday long, thin antennae. If you can see the colors, they're banded, gray and brown. They're just banded. And the labial palpi are large. They're curved upwards and they're also banded in color. So don't forget these two characters, long antennae banded, large curved banded labial palps. There's the antenna and there's the palpi. And we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk a lot about the tomato pinworm. These are the specimens we sent you as reference. They're the same size. They're lighter color instead of dark brown, they're tan or gray, light colored. But in general, they look just like the target. Look at the long, thin antennae. They are the same as in Tuta. And the um, labial pops, you know, the pictures you'll see, they're also curved and banded. This will give you immediately a false positive, and it happens to all of us. So most likely you will find this, and they also eat tomatoes, so they will be in the same area where you survey for tuta. So in summary, the tomato pinworm is similar to tuta in size, in wing shape, and coloration, but let's keep learning why they're not identical. Even before this section, you can notice some things, but they're a little bit hard to see. And you have some dry specimens to practice. In the thorax, there are three faint gray lines. They are hard to see, but in time you'll get used to that. There's three long lines in the thorax. And the wings, instead of being just mottled, they have some larger spots in rows. Usually I see that and I'm done. Oh. I know it's like, it's, it's the tomato pinworm. And if you get to see specimens already cleaned or in the glue in the right position, you'll notice underneath the hind wing, at the base of the hind wing, some very large bristles. They are called hair pencils. And you can try to practice on the specimens that uh, they sent you. There's another set of moths that I'm expecting you to see. They are the same size, about the same size. And unfortunately, most of the species will be undescribed. So we can leave it at the genus level. Sinoe or Sinoe, same family, Galekidae. There's not many things that you can use to separate them other than the genitalia, but you start noticing they have these large blotches. They always have a bar here. And to me, the wings look ridged longitudinally. It's not an official character, but in the specimens I've seen, they have ridges on their wings. This happened to us in Florida. Uh, we collected hundreds of these um, genus and happened to be a new species, it got described. So these might happen to you as well. And we have collected them from other countries that are running, as you know, I mean, to the absoluta surveys. So this has happened already in other places. As you know already, to really say you have to, that, you don't just look at their wings. If you really have a suspect, do go ahead and dissect it and you already know how, even if you use 
uh, a large abdomen for practice, it is the same technique. Notice here, the male of two taps aluta with the adiegos or phallus separated. And this is a female. So the characters are very different, male and female. All this part, you know already, the baseball cap, the extension on a hairy finger, and the broad, long vinculum. You have seen this before. It is very different. These are just the body parts, sorry. These are, these are just giving you the names of the parts. But notice here, this is what I meant to show you. Caiferia will show up in your traps very likely. Notice how different they are. The extension on the valves, they look like a, a thumb and a hand. The vincumul is long and narrow, and the oncus is a long spine. By now, you are an expert. If you end up with a female, you can still separate them. This is the female of Caiferia, the female of Tuta. They are very different. Same body parts, shaped very differently. And put next to each other, there's no way you can mix them. This is Tuta absoluta. During dissection, without having to separate the genitalia from the abdomen, just clean and transparent. And this is a formally mounted um, genitalia of Caiferia. In here, the separated parts, so you could look at everything. But normally, this would be here. And notice one more thing here. When you're doing your own dissections, the parts are not folded open like a book or a clam. They're all curled inwards. But you can still see these characters. To see all the parts well, you would have to remove them and open them up. But at this stage, I already know when I'm doing a dissection, that's a false positive, what I call it, tomato pinworm, or a likely positive. That's all I have for you, and I hope you do have some questions. Juliana, that was e exceptional. Thank you so much. And um, do we have questions. Hi, uh, I did. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, this is Claire from Bermuda. I was wondering if you could look at slide 11 when you were talking about the Sinoe. And I was just wondering if you could just go over again, where exactly was the, um, the bands? Um, oh, hang on, I'm already looking at the wrong. There was a, there was a yeah, I think it was the Sinoe that had the, the bands on the wing. It's at the very base of the four wing on the back, instead of on the front, the anterior margin, it's on the posterior margin. And even if we have, let's say 15 species, all of them have this dark band. Sometimes it's larger, sometimes smaller. But the expert that is Sang Mi Lee, I was in contact with her all week. She told me that is one of the characters that separate this genus from all other Galekidi genera. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? Hi, Linessa here. Um, we are getting this presentation. Yes, I don't think this one has been sent to you yet, but you will receive this presentation. Thank you. This was uh, quite informative. I really want to, to thank, of course, Julieta uh, Brambilla, uh, Jim Hayden, um, Sarah Berkmeyer, Andy John Louise, uh, for all the help today. I think. Uh, you know, this, this went uh, pretty well and the participants, we were so concerned about the interaction, but all of you were ready to go and, uh, and we appreciate that and your willingness to share your images so that we could see what was happening and work with you. We, I will be sending out a revised schedule for tomorrow. Remember that we're going to hear first from Dr. Uh, Todd Gilligan with uh, the survey uh, methods and um, and molecular diagnostics information related to Lepidoptera. We're also going to have some more time to specifically focus on the tomato pinworm in our groups tomorrow. And so if you, if you haven't um, started uh, the pinworm, I would encourage you with the pinworm samples that you have to go ahead and break your abdomens and start soaking them in KOH. 
you know, and um, Julieta and Jim, do you have specific instructions for tomorrow that um, related to the pinworm that I haven't mentioned? Uh, no, I don't think I do have any specific instructions. Nothing, they're just the same. We're just dealing with a smaller specimen, but the dissection is the same as for large specimens. So we're going to review more of that tomorrow as well as the survey methods. We'll also be hearing from Renita Swartzman with um, the specific protocol that you have from the Greater Caribbean Safeguarding Initiative related to the TUDA surveys. We really have, have, a, have a great um, lineup um, for tomorrow. And we'll also be hearing from Dr. Corey Pinka, who's with uh, APHIS in Miami, and he has a, a project that he's going to briefly tell you about where uh, maybe we could get involved in that uh, from a lepidopter perspective in the region as well. We are really close to time. I'm just going to leave it up to you. Do you want to go back to your breakout groups and then just leave from your breakout groups? Or um, if some breakout groups want to want me to reopen them so that they can continue working, I certainly can do that. Uh, what is the general feeling? Are we going to continue with the sections? Anybody in my group? Do you have uh, specimens prepared for the pinworm, tomato pinworm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have a little extra time. And so if anybody wants to hang out and, you know, for another 15 minutes or whatever, whatever and uh, practice, I'll be happy to. Yes. Be, for the tomato pinworm, we have to solve them, yes, sir? I'm sorry? The tomato, the tomato pinworm, we have to solve them? Have to solve them in KOH for tomorrow? Mm -hmm. um, yes. The okay. alternative would be to cook them in for 20 minutes at 20 or 30 minutes in uh, KOH at a, like a 50 or 100 Celsius. If, you, you, if, you're free, if anybody forgets to do it overnight, then they could do it quickly with a hot plate uh, for 20 minutes. But it might be better to just put a, an abdomen in right now. Okay. All right. Then. So you don't forget later in the day. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Maybe the easiest thing would be for me to just open up the breakout rooms and anybody that wants to break out can break out because I think the, the patient group may have wanted to, um, you know, break out simply because um, they, they were disconnected earlier. Um, but, um, but other groups may want to wait on the pinworm till tomorrow, it looks like. But um, uh, I can simply open the rooms and you can either join the room or decide that you're, you're done with the session and, and leave. All right, this is a great group. I'll be sending out a revised schedule for tomorrow. Thank you all for your participation. I am going to also go ahead and probably, um, maybe it would just be easier, easy in addition to having tomorrow's reminder email, I'm going to create a Teams folder just from this particular session and invite all of you uh, to it so that you can access all the files that way. Thank you so much.